Hey guys, welcome to the shop. It's upgrade week, shop equipment upgrade week. Now, coincidentally, in my last video, one of my commenters said, dude, you need a new so-and-so. Your old one is too small. And I completely agree. So we upgraded. Um, <laughs> now this piece of equipment, nowhere near new, right? Probably 70, 60, 70 years old. But for what you pay, you get an absolute beast of a piece of equipment. So let me share with you what I got and I'll show you what to look for if you want to buy one for yourself because everybody needs one of these in their shop. Uh, yeah, I stand behind that. I think so. So let me show you what I got and then we'll go over what to look for so you don't get burned, right? So my new piece of equipment, which is absolutely not new, it's probably from the 50s, is a 36-3 do-all vertical bandsaw. This is the contouring version, which I'll share a little bit more about that with you in just a second. But this thing has all the bells and whistles that you could ever want in a saw at a price that probably wouldn't get you a brand new little bitty tabletop saw these days. And they're all over the Eastern US, listing after listing of these things for a relatively reasonable price in all sorts of sizes and all sorts of features. So there's probably one out there that fit about everybody's shop or budget. So let me show you what I know about this thing and what I don't know. And, uh, you know, just give you a good look at it. It's, a, it's absolutely an awesome saw. So back in the day when engineers basically designed simply with pencil and paper, they overbuilt a lot of equipment. And this is a good example of that. Everything on this saw is probably two times or more stronger than what it really needs to be. Uh, these days you will not see a saw built to the level that this thing is. It's almost comical how heavy duty this thing is. And this is the light duty version. And I'm not joking. This saw is a three wheeled saw. So it has two guide wheels and then one drive. So guide wheel, guide wheel and drive that is hooked to the transmission. Good thing about this saw is that you don't have to necessarily run a blade that long. You can actually, with an extra guard that you can get, you can run the blade right between these two wheels here and have a much shorter band, you know, if that's what you wanted to do. Because bands are expensive, right? And this saw happens to have, and most of these do-all band saws will, a uh, built-in blade wielder, which is nice because when a saw runs a band that's this long, you definitely want to buy your, you, well, anytime you can, you want to buy your band by the box and not by the pre-made blade. You pay three times as much buying them pre-made when you can simply make them yourself on saws like this really easy. It's just simple as pushing a button. You do not have to be a professional welder to get a good quality band uh, weld with one of these. And I'll, I'll show you in just a minute. It has a three-speed transmission and a fine adjust here between, so it's pretty much infinite between its slowest speed and its high speed. You can really fine tune in your surface feet per minute using this speed indicator that's on the saw here. Neat, really, really well thought out saw. It has a coolant system. It has a, well had, it is missing a few parts, a air compressor to blow your chips away. This saw also had, well, I'll show you the coolest feature in just a second. It has a built-in coolant pump or had, it's missing that as well. So we'll have to work out some issues on it. But other than that, this saw is pretty much complete minus a few little things, uh, including the, uh, the chart that blew off when my buddy Al was moving this thing. And that kind of kind of bites, so I'll have to find one of those to complete the look of this thing. But just the cover on the front of this is probably eighth inch sheet metal. I mean, they talk about overbuilt. Uh, let me show you the drive mechanism on this thing. It reminds me of a small tractor. Um, and I'll show you some of the other, other neat features on it as well. One is super awesome. So I've got the motor and gearbox cover off of this saw. I'll give you a good look inside here. It's got a three horsepower, uh, three horsepower, three phase, 220 motor in it. Here's the variable speed drive. This pivots on this bracket here and uh, changes basically the size of these pulleys and you get an infinite range in, in from its maximum to minimum uh, sizes on these pulleys, which gives you a really fine adjustment on the speed. Got some gearbox here that you would see on a uh, medium sized yard tractor and uh, actually got a hydraulic pump. It is missing the, an air compressor or an air pump that's right here, 
which I won't put back on it because I'll hook this thing into house air. And all this did was puff air and blow your chips away while you were cutting so you could see if you were cutting to a line, you could see that easier. It is missing that and it's also missing uh, the coolant pump uh, on these tanks. This is your hydraulic tank, this is your coolant tank. But just looking in here, I mean, it's obvious that this thing is you know, made to last. And this one, luckily, is in really good shape under here. Somebody did uh, do quite a bit of service over the years or else it would not be in its uh, current condition. Now, it was nowhere near this clean though. This thing was completely caked, and if you stick around to the end of the video, I'll show you just how bad this thing was in here. It took about two days to get this thing looking like it does. So don't be fooled, I didn't buy it like this. Um, it was really, really, really nasty, and almost all of them will be. So let me show you the neatest feature on this saw, and that involves this hydraulic, this little hydraulic pump. So a lot of you will be familiar with the roll-in type saws, the hydraulically powered saws that actually push your work into the saw blade uh, for you and you don't have to do it manually. Well, this saw has a hydraulic table that does that exact same thing, which is absolutely awesome. Now, I don't know that it, if it works or not. This thing did not have hydraulic, much hydraulic fluid in it. And I just drained all that out because I wanted to clean everything up, clean out the tank, and I'm waiting on my hydraulic fluid to arrive to test that out. Although it's a really simple system and no matter what, you know, I'll get it fixed. So that is an awesome feature to have. And I'll show you underneath this table in just a second. Here's your controls to control how hard the table pushes into the band how fast it moves, you can reverse it, you can choose your speed, you can choose your force. I mean, this thing really does have some awesome features. And I've got the belt off of the hydraulic pump right now simply because uh, you know, it doesn't have any fluid in it at the moment. And I wanted to flush that system out. So let me turn this saw on and I'll show you just how quiet this thing is, you know, relatively quiet. And I'll show you the way that this, uh, the variable speed pulleys work on this thing because it's really neat. Let me turn on the phase converter first because it won't work otherwise. So I've got this thing at its slowest speed and medium. Uh, I've got some new belts on order for it. Uh, they are a little squeaky here and there, but for the most part this thing is quiet considering all that's going on uh, to drive this thing. I mean, it really, it sounds awesome. Uh, let me move the camera around here and I'll show you the uh, variable speed drive setup and I'll go through the motions and you'll see how it works. It's neat. Okay, so I'm going to speed this thing up a bit and you'll see the pulleys start changing size. And you can tell how fast, like I said, your blade is moving in surface feet per minute based on, uh, on the little speedometer here, I guess you'd call it. Now let me show you underneath the table of this thing, because uh, it's awesome. So I have not cleaned out from under the table on this thing, so it is dirty. But the table tilts, so you can cut, cut an angle with it. Here's the hydraulic cylinder. It has two large uh, uh, linear bearings, I guess you would call those, that the table slides on, and it's powered, like I said, by that hydraulic cylinder. And you can move this table up to 30 degrees. Now it has a graduated scale. Uh, on a, and a pointer down here uh, so you can get the table back square but you can you can simply use a square off the table and do that on your own as well
and obviously like on most band saws, they're adjustable. So this little extra table here is just for your work that's hanging over to support it. It's probably about 300 thousandths, maybe a quarter inch thick cast iron. Good example of you know how overbuilt these saws were. Table is a coolant through table, so any coolant that gets on the table is meant to drain to a uh, drain over there that goes back into the sump. It has end stops, so you can set how deep you want the table to go before it stops, and then you can reset it with your uh, with your controls here. T slots, so you can hook a vise to the table if you want, or pretty much anything. Clamp your work down. Let me show you what this feature here is. That's pretty neat. I may never use it, but it's neat. All right, so see that piece of tape right there when I turn this handle, see that turning? Let me show you in the book what this contraption does, and it also involves that back bracket. So here's a really neat book that I've had in my library for quite some time. I did not know that it would ever come in handy. I've looked through it before. It's all on contouring band saws by Dewall. So this is the book on that saws, you know, primary feature. So here's a good example on the front of the page of uh, cutting, you know, cutting to the line, right? Cutting radiuses. Got a chain that runs around a fixture, and his work is in the middle. And I've got a couple pages marked here. You can see by turning this hand wheel, it turns this cog that's hooked to the chain, and therefore turns the work that's getting cut in the saw. Here's a, a top view. You can see the chain runs around and it gets pulled through the, through the band, and you can turn that work by turning the hand wheel. See, there's the same, same unit that my saw has on it. There's a chain that's running around, and he's turning the handle, so pretty neat. Different type of setup, but you know, he's doing the same thing, turning the work by this hand wheel, cutting to the line while the table pulls his work through the saw. So that's pretty neat. I can't wait to get set up and actually try that, although I don't have any of the chain or the cogs or fixtures, but that's all stuff that I can, you know, come up with probably. But pretty neat. That saw's got some pretty cool features. I had never seen this done in person, but I'd like to try it. So soon I'm going to move this filing cabinet so it's kind of tight back here, but this is the blade welder and these are the saw controls. This is for the hydraulics to control the table. This is your air, this is your coolant, this is your coolant pump on or off, and saw on and off. So blade welder, this is a grinding wheel actually, so it has a built-in grinder. It sounds really good. This is the blade welder. This is what actuates the welder. You can choose how thick of a blade you're gonna be welding. It has a light that actually does not work or that's not plugged in. It also has a blade cutter. This is just a bandsaw blade that needs welded. I need to sharpen sharpen this uh, blade cutter, but you can see. Cut your blades and you put them inside the welder here. This is the old style, so they are more modern versions of this, but this does work. And once you've properly selected the size blade that you wanted to weld. You just push down on the handle. It pushes them together and welds them. And now we have a successfully welded bandsaw blade that I will now grind because it does raise up uh, some slag. You'll grind it until it fits through. It has a guide there or a check, a gauge that uh, you'll know when you've got it ground to the proper width. You can also anneal the blade once you've welded it, bring it, normalize it, right? By pushing this button here. Heat it up to a dull cherry red and then cool it down slow. And then in theory, you should have a properly welded bandsaw blade. So that's a really neat 
feature to have. So I haven't ground this one down real good yet, but in theory your weld should be as strong as the blade ever was originally. And it shouldn't break. And that's a pretty decent weld. If you bend a radius like that and they don't pop, usually they'll hold. So I would consider that a successful weld. So let me show you how to quickly store a blade or to fold it up where it's not so large. And I put my foot on, on the bottom, find the center and pull up on it. Take my hand and turn it backwards. Right? Push down while turning. And there you go. Now you got a successfully uh, rolled up blade. And to undo them, obviously you, you're going to want gloves, but you got to be really careful. A lot of people will just throw them out on the floor, but I don't like to do that. I just try to be really, really careful when I unroll them. So let's quickly go through what you need to look for, and I'll show you the condition of all the parts on this saw that are of importance as well. We'll go over all the parts that you need to look for if you wanted to buy one of these for yourself. Now, on a saw like this and of this vintage, you're really going to want some good pictures if you cannot go and see the saw in person. And uh, the main thing on these saws really is the condition of the variable speed drive. Now they made a lot of different versions of it and not all of them look like this one does, but probably the majority of the older saws will look like this. I've heard a lot of stories of people buying these saws and the variable, in fact, Tom Lipton uh, from Ox Tools was one of the gentlemen who I believe bought a saw like this and then found out that somebody had stripped out the drive system on it and then tried to adapt it to something uh, uh, you know, that wasn't, it wasn't meant to be, uh, simply because they may have had some problems with the existing unit and didn't know how or wasn't uh, capable of repairing it properly. You want pictures of the drive system to make sure that it's at least all there before you buy one of these. That's, I think, the most important thing. Um, let me show you some of the other things because there's a lot of other wear items on these saws that you're going to have issue with, especially with a saw like this. And this one has those issues, so it'll be a good example. So wear item number one will be the tires on the uh, on the guide wheels here. Now, this one has obviously, since it's been new, has had a set of tires or two on it. In fact, it says replaced rubber tires 316-1965. So I know that they're at least that new. Actually, this thing's probably had multiple sets of tires on it. But these look... They're all there. There's no chunks out of them. Uh, they are dry rotted a bit. They didn't do the best job putting them on, but they actually run pretty smooth. So, you know, that is serviceable in my opinion. Now I've checked them all and they're basically all the same. Do have some dry rotting on them, but you know, they are there and you can get them. They're not uh, unobtainium. So that's one thing you want to check. If they're all broken out, these rubbers on the wheels, you know, either pass on the saw or consider the fact that you're going to have to replace those. You also may want to check and see if it has all the guides. This saw has a rack for them for the extra blade guides that hold that uh, rub up against the uh, different width blades. So that's a nice thing that these are in here. So let me show you some other things. So if at all possible, with any piece of equipment, really not just saws, you want to hear it run. You want to see it go through all of the motions and, you know, that gives you confidence that at least everything's there and it's working somewhat the way that it should. It has a good chance of being in decent condition. If you cannot hear a saw run or a piece of equipment run, I immediately reduce what I'm going to pay for it by a third because I assume that there's going to be stuff wrong with it. and. Usually pieces of equipment that have age on them, there's going to be some things. It's just to be expected. Uh, so buy accordingly. If you can hear it run, do so. But if you can't, reduce what you're going to pay. Uh, they should not sound like a soup can full of marbles. When everything's in proper order, they're pretty quiet. I'll show you some things to check for if you can in person on, 
on the drive mechanism on these because there is a lot that can go wrong back there and I'll show you what to look for. Uh, but while we're up front, let's first look at these blade guides because these are a major wear item and this is a good example of a uh, worn set of blade guides. So here's a look at the blade guides on this. These are simple friction guides. They just kind of push on the blade. These are adjustable and they keep the blade centered, keep it from wandering from side to side. And then on the back, this one has a bearing here. Pull that back and spin that bearing. And it's super crunchy and it's no good. It needs replaced. In fact, it's wore all the way down to it's rubbing the shield, the metal shield on it. So all of these either need replaced or if you had a surface grinder, you could simply regress these uh, guides. But you get the idea. There's all sorts of different uh, blade guides. This is just an example of one configuration. But assume on an old saw that you're going to have to clean up, adjust, or replace everything that guides the blade. Let me show you the lower one because it's coming completely apart. The bearing is completely obliterated uh, down there. So it's been a long time since these blade guides have been serviced at all. I'll show you uh, if I can get this loose with this back bearing on this one. Maybe I will. But this is all parts that are relatively easy to fix. Just a, not a deal breaker as long as all of it's complete. Let's see that bearing there. All the balls are completely out of it shot. That's not uncommon, but you get the idea. All that's going to have to be fixed, right? So buying one of these vintage saws, I mean, it's kind of a gamble. Really, you have the potential to get a, an amazing saw that most of us could never afford to buy anything even close to that quality, brand new, but you also have the potential to get an absolute POS, something that's been uh, rigged or modified in ways that it was never intended to be and half works, right? Does not have the features that it probably should have. There are lots of cases of these things have an issue with the drive mechanism and that's only because they never got serviced because uh, otherwise they really do hold up forever. And, uh, you know, people buying these and then finding out that, hey, you know, it's been stripped and modified and just not what it's supposed to be. So if you can get some pictures inside the engine housing, engine, motor housing for the gearbox, speed control, whatever, it's a good idea because you don't want to have to replace this kind of stuff. And, I mean, you don't want to have to do any more work than you have to because on a saw of this age, you're going to have to do some work. Like these belts, 60 to 80 bucks a piece. You know, imagine if this pulley was bad and the machine work that would be involved in that, and you may not, you may or may not have the capability to do that, and then you've just spent your money for nothing. So for a lot of people, it's a big gamble. So I think you get the idea. There's a ton of work to do to this thing that I don't have time to get into this week, but we will get this thing up and running very soon, and I'm extremely excited to have this. I've been waiting years to get a proper bandsaw, and up to this point, a lot of you guys know I've been using the little Harbor Freight 4x6 bandsaw, and it's done almost everything that I've needed to do, albeit a little bit slow. <laughs> You know, it's a perfectly capable little saw. That's why I wasn't too in too much of a rush to, to get something like this. But in any shop, if you do any work, you'll spend a lot of time at the bandsaw cutting, you know, rough stock to size to machine. And it's important, I think, to have a nice bandsaw. All the woodworkers know it, and anybody who's been into metalworking for, you know, any length of time will appreciate a quality bandsaw. We have a much uh, a saw much like this at work that I've been using forever, and that's why I'm partial to, uh, to these do-all saws. I've got one outside that needs some love for too long, hopefully. 
Now, all my parts are sent off to be ground for the do-all milling machine, so we should get those back before too awful long, and that will mean that this milling machine here, the old uh, Bridgeport clone, will be out of here, and I'll get a lot more room over in this area. And I'm excited to get that do-all milling machine done as well. So stay tuned. If you want to see how this thing got off the trailer and got in the shop, man, that was an adventure. And huge thanks to my buddy Al for all the help on this thing. He is an amazing individual, um, and there should be more people like him. He really is a awesome guy. So thank you, Al. I appreciate all the help. And uh, maybe next week we'll make our first cut with this thing. Test the hydraulics. See how, see how or if it works. It will, but you know, maybe not uh, as soon as I'd like. We'll see. So that's it. Check out the end of the video. Tell Elizabeth happy birthday because uh, Monday, this coming Monday, is her birthday. So she'll appreciate that. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoy the unload footage. See you next time. Oh, no, I didn't tell you that my truck is broken. Somehow it got broken. Somehow it got broken? Ah, uh, the brakes were hanging up on it and... Uh, and I was angry. Right. This is the day I went and got those tanks. Okay. How, just a couple more details. How did this all happen? I mean, uh, I, I, yeah, I, mean, I had to go get those cylinders, right. right? I was in a hurry. And it was just one of those mornings where everything was going wrong right. and the brakes were sticking on it. And right. I was like, okay. So somehow the accelerator pedal got held to the floor and then the clutch just got dropped out on the slipped out the clutch just, slipped, the clutch slipped, slipped off, off my foot uh, and uh, Did it, was a loud, unpleasant noise? Uh, there's a there was a uh, unpleasant pop hmm. and then I've had to put it in four-wheel drive to drive it up on the hill and have the front end pull it we will get a picture but the world being shocked about trailer brakes not working no, I'm even on a trailer that is two years old that's, that ain't right. That just ain't right. I mean, I'm sorry, man. This wasn't a $200 trailer. No, I don't. No, it don't, was not a $200 trailer. I don't doubt that. And it should not be doing this. It should not be doing this. So we were going to disconnect the trailer from the truck. We were going to chalk the wheels and jack it up the back of the trailer to give us less of an angle when we pull this machine off. So... Al's suggestion was that we just pull the pin on the trailer brakes, electronic trailer brakes, instead of chalking the wheels. So pulled the box that the battery's in. This trailer is two years old and uh, the connections are just rotted completely off of this thing. <laughs> so. so we're using a large a DC power supply, adjustable DC power supply, because I don't have a battery laying around to power the brakes and hopefully they'll work. That's the plan. We'll see. Let's give it a shot. Let's hook it up. Man, for a, an essential item like trailer brakes to be as garbage as these are. Breakaway. This, yeah. Safety breakaway trailer brakes. So when the trailer disconnects, it's supposed to stop it. Uh, And those and the ones in my bumper might be a little bit smaller. Those are too fat. There. Yeah, now it's pulling. All right. Now, so it's pulling eight amps. Now I'll put it in neutral. And let's see if we move. Wow. Yeah, not surprised trailer brakes didn't work, though. I don't know, I couldn't tell, I didn't look. We can... Uh, I want to do it right. Let's just make sure that it works. What are you doing? I'm just loading it up so it, I'm going to put it in neutral. Yeah. yeah. Just to make sure that it, it actually works. Because I'm going to be putting the crank way up in the air. Yeah. And I don't want it in the creek. No. Well, they may work now, now that we've somewhat tried to fix them. Keep going. That's it. Yeah, it's, they're working. Right. So 
off the brakes, it's all, just all the electrical little bits and pieces that are supposed to power. Right. Hey. All the parts that you really should count on up, up front there to stop the trailer if it comes off. Both the battery and the pin, no good. Let's not kick the extension cord out while we're doing it. No. That would be the definition of a really, really, really bad thing. Wow. Talk about enlightening. Yeah, that's a shame that that stuff was so cheap. I mean, well, first of all, it's got the plastic wire loom that they put on around all the wires, mm -hmm. and it goes through a hole, you know, this in the box. The plastic wire loom can't seal anything. No. No. And what do they expect at the back end of a vehicle, right? On in Minnesota. Yeah. In the winter. Are yeah. Same. Yes. God, we're lucky if they last five years. So now that we somewhat got the trailer brake sorted, it's time to try to get this thing off the trailer. And uh, I'm guessing this thing weighs anywhere from two to 3,000 pounds. And there was Elizabeth reminding me that this video is not sponsored by Hanes. And to tuck my shirt in. <laughs> this piece of equipment is going to be pretty top-heavy. Large cast iron table up high. It is obviously a tall machine. So, you know, we have to consider that as we move this thing you know, down the trailer ramps. We also have to get it off of the pallet. We're going to move it down the ramps and then remove it from the pallet right as it comes onto the shop floor. That way we can roll it on pipes because once this thing gets in the shop, I don't have any way to lift it up to remove the pallet out from under it, at least easily anyway. So we're going to try to do it all in one go. And each one of these pieces of equipment that I move is a learning experience in itself and they're individuals, so it's fun and testing at the same time, I guess.
That's the only button. You you won't delete nothing with that. That one. Yes. Right there. Stop and start. Yes. Stop and start. Oh, all right. Tight seal. And do it, and uh, that doesn't always happen. So I need a couple of small parts to make it 100% happy. I can do a filter bag. It sure would be nice if it had a. Uh, Tag on the top door. Yeah. I wonder what they use to set the level for. I mean, they say two and a half gallons, but... It's been dipstick. I don't know what that. What are you but doing? I wonder why, why two and a half, why not three and a half? No. So there is a look at the filter that come out of the hydraulic tank on that uh, saw. Not what I expected. It's actually a brazed or soldered brass mesh or screen. Right? And not crazy dirty, not completely clogged or anything like that. Just needs cleaned up and I think that's it. Cork gasket around it. Pretty old and well made actually.
we go. Clean, clean. There we go. Oh, that was hard. That's you doing right, huh? Now I'll just disconnect. Wait, hold on. Mm hmm. Yeah, they're either dry or they need replaced. We'll have to see. Grease it, run it, and see. That's a common thing. Yeah, well, people never grease the motors, so they go bad. I'm doing all right. to break through the storm. 